Well, I'm delighted to be here, particularly to discuss this amazing exhibition, The Land We Live In, The Land We Left Behind, which, um, as I'm sure you all know, um, is an old migrants' workers' uh, toast. Um, and the exhibition features, what, about 200 works, and um, they all focus on um, so the contradictory relationship society has with the rural. So the panel today are um, Adam Sutherland, who is the curator of the show, and also director of Grisdale, the radical arts institution in the rural Cumbria countryside. Um, and then we have Simon Mayhew Archer, who is a writer and producer of the hit BBC series, This Country, which I think we can agree is a pretty dissenting vision of the rural. And finally, uh, Fumihoto um, Sumitomo, and he is um, the director of Art Mebashi in Japan, and has recently been working on a series of exhibitions that focus on everyday life, um, ranging from the food we eat, uh, right up into the way that the modern world has, has an impact on local culture, I would agree. Um, and we're going to start with a short clip from this country, which I think is going to come up. Can we turn it slightly? Yeah. Close your eyes and you can be in Downton Abbey. Um, <laughs> Simon, what was it about this country? What did you recognise in it that kind of made you attracted to work on it? Um, well, really, it, it, start, it started from the very base level of we had Kerry, the character, um, and then Curtin, who... They're actually brother and sister in real life, but they play cousins. And they're from Sirencester, and I'm from a place called Abingdon in Oxfordshire. And so we all had a shared appreciation of what it's like growing up in a place like in, in the Cotswolds or you know, near the Cotswolds, because everyone thinks that you're really posh and you know, it's all a bit jolly hockey sticks and this, that and the other. And you know, when you grow up there, you realize it's absolutely not like that. And there are these large pockets of sort of deprivation and so really, you know, Kerry and Curtin are these working class, quite sort of unreconstructed, rough kids. And they are forever held back by the sort of twee context that they find themselves in. And so then it was a case of finding a village in the Cotswolds that felt right for those characters. And so we drove around the three of us plus the director Tom we had a really nice day driving around the Cotswolds and went to like Bybury and Borton on the Water and they're all two twee and then we found a place called North Leach which has got the sort of quintessential Cotswoldian tech like village centre but then has got um, you know sort of social housing which is exactly where Kerry and Curtin live and so immediately you've got that very very small world where you have the entire, you know, range of class. And that's then, yeah, that sort of becomes the, the bedrock of the show. Well, yeah, I was just thinking, and I, I'd like to ask the panel each in turn, but I'll start with you, Simon. If um, you remember the time when you maybe first recognised there was this sort of disconnection between what society maybe sees of the rural and, and thinks of the rural and, and perhaps your own experiences of it. Have you got a particular memory? Yeah, I mean... So where I grew up, Abingdon is actually quite, you know, it's a, it's a nice town um, outside of Oxford. 
and I remember going on a school trip to Cog's Farm and my parents, who I've subsequently come to realise are completely naff and don't have any interest in the countryside whatsoever, um, they, my mum was asking me about what I'd, what I'd enjoyed about Cog's Farm and all I could talk about was uh, all the poos I'd seen the sheep do. And that was it. And I remember my mum being, like, really pushing me on it. But there was nothing else I could offer her from that day at Cox Farm. And then subsequently, uh, a friend of, a friend of mine, but, and my mum knew his mum, it transpired that we'd seen lambs being born and all manner of exciting things at Cox Farm, but none of them had gone into my head. All I'd focused on was the variety and size of droppings that I'd seen. And that is really, that sums up my <laughs> relationship with the countryside. Fumihiko, is yours quite so uh, visceral? <laughs> um, your experience of the sort of disconnection between the, the rural, the, the idealised version of the rural and your own experience of it. Um, I, I was grown up in rural like half of my life and I was grown up in Tokyo uh, less of half. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of going back and forth between rural and city. And I, uh, through my career, I worked in the big museums. But uh, my museum opened in October 2013. And I had experience of uh, working in um, Kanazawa. It's a city uh, the other side of Tokyo. So it's more facing to the Japan Sea, and it's a very conservative town. And we made a big, huge museum there. And we were regarded as a foreigner in this town. Um, uh, do you know Captain Perry? He came to Japan in the uh, 19th century, and we were regarded as a, the people, team of the Perry <laughs> in this city, Kanazawa, because they thought that contemporary art is coming big ship is coming to Kanazawa. So I had this experience of being there, uh, called as a foreign armies coming to <laughs> this uh, local city. So when I start working um, my bashi, um, I sort of try to remember how I was grown up in a rural city, a rural town. And um, I, I remember I, we often eat insects, the butterflies. That doesn't happen now. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother asked me to, my, because we are boy brothers, um, so we were well, really, really uh, happy to, you know, collect these butterflies, and we eat at night. But it doesn't happen this, I think, 10 or 20 years. So then I thought of, let's make an exhibition on food. You know, so we, we can really uh, regain this memory of eating insects in this region in Maebashi also. So this is kind of my uh, experience and what I'm doing at the museum. Yeah. Any insects in your memory, uh, Adam? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I was brought up in um, rural Gloucestershire, <laughs> near Broadway, uh, on an estate of a sort. <laughs> a different sort of a state. Um, um, and I think my um, most jarring thing I recall was my brother going to London, um, apart from going to boarding school, which was quite jarring. But my brother moved to London uh, to go to college, and he came back after the first maybe term or so, I guess. And I remember thinking, oh, he's gone hard. He's like, he rings like a bell. His, his, the timbre of his personality has changed. Uh, I should point out that he'd gone to ballet school, but <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> it, seemed, it seemed to toughen him up in some way. And I remember thinking that about, thinking about the urban uh, and the city as this very, kind of, uh, as very different and very much, a much tougher place than the rural. Uh, I think the other thing, which uh, perhaps was slightly later in my life, um, and a recognition of the depiction of the rural through a film called Straw Dogs, which I do actually um, reference in the exhibition. Uh, it's a fairly unpleasant film. Uh, and at the beginning of it, there's a depiction of a Cornish pub. 
And I remember thinking, I definitely recognize that pub. That is the best kind of depiction of rural, real rural life that uh, you know, really resonates. I, I recognize that. And it took an American uh, director, Sam Peckinpah, who made very violent westerns to uh, depict English country life realistically, in my mind, anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, touching on this, um, I mean, Adam, this feels like an exhibition that's been a long time coming. I mean, going around it, there are so many um, different aspects of the rural and the kind of concept of utopia in this show. Um, would I be right in saying that this is something that you've been thinking about and pondering as director of Grisdale, but also, you know, expanding on that for the last of 18 years or so? Yeah, I mean, I have uh, worked at Grisdale for 18 years and relatively uncomfortably in the middle of the glorious Lake District. Um, uh, I always feel like a, a dissonant note in a, rural, in a rural location in many ways, especially one like that, which is very... Um, simplified and understood in a very simplistic way as a kind of beautiful place. That's what it is. It's not a complicated uh, it's a combination of uh, dissonant cultures. It's, it's, uh, it's just a beautiful place. Uh, and um, I guess my, yeah, my background was I, I, lived in, I did live in London for 15 years and I, I couldn't really stand it. Um, at the end of it. I had to move back to the country, even though I don't really like the countryside. It is somewhere <laughs> that I, I fit, in a way. Uh, and I think what I'm really interested in is the, the idea of a rural mindset, that the way you think in a rural place is very different from how you think in an urban place. And I think both things are very important both ways of thinking. But my interest and what I'm trying to depict in this exhibition really is that rural mindset. And I was really interested by the way the press responded to the show. So on the whole, it's like mod you know, positive reviews, but very few people actually got it, uh, despite the fact that I took them round it. That may not help them get it, to be honest. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, there, there was a very kind of urban view of it. Uh, people didn't really understand the chaotic nature of the way that it was put together. And my thought, my thinking is that that is how the rural is put together. It is a lot of very disparate elements that don't really connect. And the dynamism and energy and the mindset comes from how you do connect those things together. Uh, and that, that for me is where all my kind of creative ideas come from. These collisions, this almost car crash culture of the rural which is very well illustrated in, <laughs> in your work. Um, so yeah, behind, behind the show, that's what I, I, I was kind of looking at. I think also the show takes uh, it almost, uh, my particular generation, I, my, I, I've been through a, a really um, Ruskinian education. I went to public school, I went to Dartington Hall, which is featured in, uh, as a free school. Um, and all of, these, all of these moments in my life were kind of informed by um, a kind of Ruskin, really, and an arts and crafts um, uh, ideology evolving through the 60s. So it is, it is a little bit of a, a portrait of my generation, I guess, and my generation's res response to place and the importance of place. Um, I don't feel a place as important at all. Uh, I don't feel any of the content um, in the exhibition is that important. What I think is important is the mindset, how it makes you think, what it inspires. Well, it's interesting you should say it's about your generation because one thing I really noticed, when I, when I was living in Shoreditch, when Adam started Grisdale, this very strange phenomenon started where artists would leave Shoreditch and disappear for a few months and then come back and I'd walk into a gallery and there'd be bird song, or there'd be, I'd go into another gallery and there would be um, you know, farming antlers. or something. <laughs> antlers. antlers. There were a lot of antlers. <laughs> and it took me a long time to suddenly realise that all these artists were disappearing off to Grisdale to do residencies and then coming back. And I so my first experience of you was more as this kind of agent that where we often talk about the urban artists going into the rural and creating some kind of, you know, gesture on the rural, you were doing the exact opposite. You were basically sending your agents down to make rural gestures on the yeah. urban. <laughs> I didn't really want this? them to do that. <laughs> That's what the, that was them translating 
the ideas back into um, yeah. into a, an art world, really, and, a, and an urban context. It, yeah, it was an it's an it was an interesting history, and I think at that time the art movements had been YBA, hmm. followed by what what you might term a warehouse movement, which was all about urban space. Public art had become very urban, and there was a moment for the. It was, I recognised at that time that there was going to be a return and an interest in the rural just by through the change of you know passage of time mm. and cycles. Um, and I was it, I I understood the rural as this incredibly rich context uh, for making work, and I wanted to I wanted to reinvent that. I wanted that to be part of what contemporary artists engaged with. So that was you know that was the ambition, mm. and all of those artists came to Grisdale and th what they were able to do was take a slightly different body of material back into the art world that made them look different from all their peers and made them stand out and for in many cases made them very successful. Well yeah, um, no, that's what I was going to say. I mean, over the last 18 years you've pretty much transformed the face of British art, I'd say, you know, and there's two, uh, seriously, without being hyperbolic, I have to say this, it's ridiculous, but, you know, Grisdale, and I will add Wising Art Centre here, it's really interesting that possibly the two most influential institutions for art in this country both are way out in the countryside, quite difficult to get to, not easy places to be, and it's quite interesting that I wouldn't want to use the Turner Prize as a bellwether for anything, but a lot of the artists that have been nominated have come out of both camps. So it's, it, what is this about the countryside and the artists that generates such creativity, I suppose, when you think that obviously it should be Depending done. on how it's used. I mm. mean, it doesn't always <laughs> generate creativity. But uh, the exhibition does do look at the number of arts, cultural uh, movements that come out of the rural and, mm. and have. And, and in St Ives, they were talking about pluralism. They were talking about the same notions of, of colliding cultures uh, so th th it's not a it's not a new idea, and it, 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 it is something I think it is. If you if you accept that and acknowledge and work with that, rather than the other picture postcard um, territory that is more familiar, I think the kind of real gritty side of the rural is actually is where the ins inspiring and creative thinking comes from. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think this country, I mean, to me, that's like fantastic creative program that, that plays against the norms uh, and uh, it, like re reinvents a kind of a, a type of comedy. Yeah, well, yeah, Simon, with that in mind, I mean, was it, was it difficult <laughs> to, um, to, I mean, to persuade the BBC to do something like this? I mean, was, was there a kind of a, sort of an appetite for looking at the aurora in this slightly uh, dystopic way, possibly? Um, it wasn't hard because we were really, really cheap. Oh. Um, <laughs> But the so Daisy, Daisy who plays Kerry, um, she's you know her and Charlie, her brother, they're tremendously talented, and the commissioner at BBC Comedy, a guy called Shane Allen, could see he had really bought into them them as people, um, particularly Daisy, and so then when we started working together, we really had a, a totally blank slate, um, and like I say, we weren't. You know, we, don't, we were actually only commissioned to make four episodes, and we ended up over-delivering and giving them six. Um, but we were totally left alone. And I remember after we'd spent a few weeks working on it, and and the thing was that those characters, they they're very true to life, and so we that was our starting point. And so then the idea of doing it as a, a mockumentary um, really came about because that was the simplest, most straightforward context. To you, We wanted to present the mass true. And so then you get hopefully an added joke. What I liked was the idea that if you present this documentary as quite sort of po-faced, pretentious, looking at this enormously grand subject of, um, you know, young life in rural Britain, um, and then you just focus in on these two <laughs> layabouts. It's like that, that is funny in and of itself. Um, and so then, yeah, well, we started working together. We'd sort of come up with this loose idea. And I emailed Shane. I said, it's going to be, I was like, it's probably going to disappear without a trace, but it's going to be really, really real and really raw. 
and he was like sounds great good luck and and so then we went and we shot it in we shot the first series in 17 days that's quick and then kind of we after a, a few days of filming i was like oh i really like this this is this is everything i hoped and more and so then it was a case of letting the audience find it really and having the confidence and patience that an audience will come to it and fundamentally we, what gave me confidence was a i think it's funny you know and i'm obviously biased but um b is that most that is the experience of most people living in britain and i was used to think that this idea of a london bias in the media was a, a bit of an easy stick to yeah. sort of beat the media with but actually I, there is something in that because you know whether you grew up in a small town like I did, um, my experience is still closer to, you know, living in a Cotswold village than it is to living in a in a big sort of urban, you know, housing estate or something. Um, and so essentially, there was a huge audience ready to be tapped into, and and I'm glad that we haven't, you know, s screwed that up in a way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it is kind of uh, ruthlessly honest uh, in many ways. It's um, I recognise it from my childhood, uh, from my teenage years. It, it resonates for me, and my, my, my background's different, but I, I still had all the same experiences of the rural and same responses in many ways to it. Um, I think, yeah, it's really, I'm really interested in the, I, of, of the idea of sat it's satire. I mean, I, in effect, satire. Uh, and actually the idea that satire does reinforce stereotypes and actually uh, perpetuate them. So. <laughs> I think it, although it is finding a truth, it's going to, it's amplifying that truth yeah. in a big way, um, as comedy, as that kind of comedy often does. Well, it, and it's that fundamental, you know, it's like Kerry wants to be hard. She wants to be seen as a sort of a threat and someone who needs to be taken seriously because of her, you know, she's physically well built and she'll have you. But you, you can't be hard if you're from Cerny Wick. <laughs> It's ju you are naturally undermined by your very context, no matter how hard. And actually, the harder you try, the sadder it gets. And that's a great starting point for comedy. That's my point, but with my experience with my brother. Yeah. You're just soft if you're from the countryside. <laughs> <laughs> and often you have a soft accent to go with it, well, yeah. which is you know, unavoidable. I, I do remember that from my childhood in the countryside with people. Um, assimilating East End accents in South Devon, which I'm sure still goes on. <laughs> it goes on in Cumbria. It's an estuarine kind of accent that young yeah. people adopt. Yeah. Well, Fumihiko, is, is this a similar thing in Japan? Would you say there's a sort of strangeness between the hard, and hard Tokyo and the soft <laughs> centre of the countryside? Yes and no. I, I don't know. Um, maybe I could not pick up some of the, uh, the conversation. But uh, um, the, the thing that we do at uh, a museum is uh, mostly uh, probably the artisan residence program is the one who, which we uh, confront with the neighbors uh, of the museum. So uh, we always face with the, um, the artists requesting us to do very weird things. Like Fernando Garcia Dori, <laughs> he came to Maebashi and asked us to bring a Buto dancer, the very avant-garde dancer, to the cheese farmer's place and do some <laughs> lessons <laughs> of <laughs> cheese farmers, you know, try to tell the Buto dancer of their behavior, the body movement, and the other way around. But when we tell this idea to the farmers, you know, what happens? <laughs> they have no idea. Huh? We are too busy, you know. <laughs> what, are, what we gain from this <laughs> project? So, but uh, at the end, if I imagine, if I do this in Tokyo, mm. maybe we're going to some um, nowhere to go. But uh, in Maebashi, we can find people to really do this. And at the end, people enjoy this <laughs> very much. So, you know, where it's very soft, and but at the beginning it's always difficult mm. Yeah. Mm. so there's a reaction to begin with but then yeah. there's sort of an acceptance that you may be mad but yes i think uh yeah 
because of time wise, I think in Tokyo, mm. oh no, please, oh, I'm busy. No? Mm. 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 But so in, in the Maebashi, I think people can finally, okay, next Sunday I have time, all right, <laughs> come, come over. <laughs> That's what happens usually. <laughs> I always enjoy in our village that uh, people will often say, the thing is that we're really busy here. Um, it, it's all right for all you London people, you know, the artists that come up from London, they've got plenty of time. People in London have got loads of time, but we're here we're really busy. <laughs> we can't fit in doing buto dance and, um, and knitting. <laughs> Actually, we very much try not to get them to do that sort of thing. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to move on to one of the major aspects of your exhibition, which is utopia. And what is it about the fact that we, when we imagine utopias or we strive to create utopias in the world, they tend to be, with a focus on the countryside, utopias tend to be set up in the countryside. Um, yeah, what, what do you think it is that somehow we feel that there's a sort of more of an authenticity to the way you could live a good life or whatever in the countryside I, rather than the town? I think it's more that it's regarded as a blank canvas right. and that, that, that there's room to, to try, something out, try something different out. But I, mean, I also think you know, utopias are almost inevitably satirical to a degree. Uh, Thomas More's utopia was obviously a satire. Um, so that I, the kind of there's a tongue-in-cheek kind of element to all of those kind of movements, rural movements. Uh, what do you think? Even Dartington, where you studied, yeah, I think I don't so. remember there being much of a tongue-in-cheek. Well, not latterly, <laughs> but you know, the people that initiated it would, would have been conscious of the a level of absurdity about an, any attempt. I mean, everybody has to be conscious that it's a ridiculous ambition. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could look at. Grisdale and, and people often think I'm trying to create a utopia and you know may, I am you know in a way and I mean you know, Kerry and uh, Curtin are trying to create a utopia uh, but they know it's futile I know it's futile I know it's not going to work but I do think it's really important to keep trying to do it uh, that is to me the nature of, of that process of, of, of trying well you're trying to change trying to change things you're trying to change the world around you uh, and, and, it, and it's obvious it, it is utopian but doomed to fail but has still to be done <laughs> and then that's the role for art is it it's, it's there to what, failure <laughs> <laughs> well, they're very good at that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the role for art hmm, that was another, that's a very different question but uh, the role the functional role for art which um, I'm very interested by and which this exhibition talks about quite a lot of uh, um, uh, the art as a, as a way that other cultures connect uh, as a kind of uh, glue between uh, mycelin as you know the, there's a lot of reference to mycelin mushrooms in the exhibition that notion that these that somehow art is the it's not a product it's a process and it's part of it's a it's an action it's a verb and it's part of what connects other things together and it's one of the things that for me art has decided to turn itself into a, an esoteric um, elitist activity in, a, in its own silo, referencing itself constantly. Uh, and that isn't, that isn't its, for me, that's not its function. I mean, it can be that, and lots of people will, will, want, will enjoy art in that form. But for me, it's, it has a really definite social function, and it, it historically has, and it needs to re regain that function and reconnect communities, society, politics, uh, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, it's part of creating our, it's part of the process of utopia. So could I say this exhibition is sort of your manifesto, almost? Yeah, in many ways it is, but then every exhibition I do is a manifesto. Right, yeah. Just slightly different themes. <laughs> it's very close to my heart, this exhibition. Yes. I, 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 yeah. I, I do recognise it as quite autobiographical. Mm -hmm. And I haven't shied away from adding things in that are absolutely autobiographical, like the school I went to. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it from a reasonable distance. Uh, the school was a disaster when I was there and was shut down. And uh, I suppose it's part of, you know, part of what informs my view of the, of the rural, that the fantasy did not marry up to any kind of reality. Uh, but the ambition and the 
um, ethos behind it, I think, are fascinating. I was fascinated by them at the time, and I still am. And I, and, and I think they're worth, absolutely worth revisiting. Mm. And I wish, I wish that the estate would revisit that. I wish that uh, you know, many other um, arts organizations would embrace that approach and that, that, that thinking. Mm, well, it's that interesting. There. I mean, I was at Dartington, obviously, after you, but um, at the very end of its time. And I always feel that I was, nowadays, looking back, enormously privileged to actually be kicking around in the wreckage of somebody else's dream, which is very much what it was like when I was there. It was very much at the end. Um, no one was speaking to each other. The entire thing had collapsed. Mm. But somehow, even being at the end of a utopian vision is a privilege. It's 80 years old by then, though, surely. It must have been. Yeah, 20s oh, it 20 started. 25? Yeah. 1925 yeah, it started? Yeah, yeah, so quite, yeah. Mm. And, um, but of course, for me, it was quite interesting because, of course, it was after the Berlin Wall. Um, so the greatest utopian experiment had already collapsed. So it was quite interesting seeing these other utopian experiments kind of collapsing in the 90s as it went on. Mm. And I think that's something that I do feel quite a lot with your work and with, with the, the artists that you work with, that you're often kind of, yeah, saying, great, it doesn't matter that it's a beautiful failure. It's, it's the fact that it's the striving that seems to be... But it's the process in the end that yeah. is the important bit. Well, Fumihiko, I mean, let's talk about your theories as well, because it has similar eminence to what um, Adam's been doing in Grisdale. It is about um, everyday life and how art can be a tool and a use, which is obviously something that, that Adam touches on. And um, what have you found out of your theories? What is it the kind of the, the where does the work fit in to these everyday um, investigations on society? Um, uh, every autumn we have an exhibition uh, on the theme of this everyday life and it started with uh, clothing and we did uh, living and eating and speaking and then we have a listening. <laughs> so um, yeah, the, the reason that we started this series was um, it's an area that has been become very rich with uh, silk exporting uh, in the um, late 19th century. So obviously it comes to England, France, to the Europe. And so we try to uh, rediscover this history by starting off the exhibition of the clothing. And, um, but we, we don't want to promote this area with this history because you know you have this proudness or whatever but we also want to bring out the um the foreign artists or artists from outside to uh raise other voices um because what the local people find about this uh, area was quite um i would say like simple but in fact, it's very, very complex. There was an anarchist, uh, the famous uh, modern poet uh, with a strong anarchist uh, movement were there, but people try not to look at it. And also, um, there were quite important, uh, also another poet uh, movement uh, that became very uh, influential to the Mingay movement uh, called Shirakabaha. Uh, were also born in this area, but nobody tries to pay attention to it. But if the museum tries to focus it, I think it becomes quite a kind of elitist way to look at it. So maybe we will do this kind of exhibition in the future. Uh, not maybe as good as Adam does in like <laughs> this, but uh, we want to see more like complex uh, history uh, taking more time to uh, discover with these uh, local people because if we bring the people from the Tokyo to you know find out this history that could be easily done but uh, I think we need at least like 10 years to do this so it's so we have a kind of structure of uh, art projects and exhibitions that uh, could be um, reached in some certain point in 10 years after. So this is how we started this exhibition series. Mm -hmm. and it's this longevity that you're working towards. Yes. Mm. yes. Well, it's interesting. 
I'm just thinking right now of the idea of Kerry and Curtin, like wandering around Hauser and Worth and wondering what they would make of it right now. <laughs> Could we see possibly that episode? Could we have that next time? <laughs> Yeah, it certainly starts the mind whirring. It's the <laughs> I think they spend a lot of time with the goats. They like animals. Um, yeah, it's inter just going back to what Adam was saying about the the importance of art and you know the fact that it's sort of cons consistently under threat. Really, um, that speaks to something that we were very keen to include in in this country in terms of we put the every episode has what we call a fact card. Um, which are usually, we sort of, we, uh, we have an idea of what we want the fact card to say because it's got to be, you know, it's got to work within the context of the show and the sort of storylines. And then we sort of go and Tom and I research um, and find, you know, an article or some, a report that we can glean a, you know, a nice juicy fact that sort of helps contextualise it. And the, the, the grim irony is that a lot of them actually come from uh, a body called the Commission for Rural Affairs, which was set up by um, under Labour a few years ago, uh, ostensibly to look at the fact and shine a light on the fact that the rural Britain is often left behind. And actually, there are these large pockets of deprivation that aren't that are ignored. And you know the, the the issues with unemployment and the lack of accessibility and you know broadband and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so that's that's been a great that that commission was a great source for us for our fact cards, but that commission has itself been disbanded, <laughs> which sort of shows the you know what the sort of modern government mm. how they um, you know how they regard the country and the rural. And it's going back, you know, that's the risk, is that it's going back to being an afterthought. And like art, it's these things that are seen as, you know, if they're not pushed and they're not looked after, then they, they can get mistreated really quite badly and disregarded. But you have to establish what is the value of, the, of, the rural, of rural, what is the rural culture, what's important about it. Does it matter if it disappears? Do we need it? You know, all those sort of things. I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is what I've said earlier, is that we do need the mindset. We don't necessarily need the specific actions. We don't necessarily need to retain traditions and so on. But they are all part of what make up this co the complexity of it. And so the, argu the argument about the value of rural and its relationship to urban is, is to me the reason, is one of the reasons you retain it. But that it's worth, I don't know if protecting is the right word, valuing the things that work, I think, is the important thing. I think once you start protecting something, you've really lost. You've lost the game. And there's something like the rural, um, whatever it's called, rural commission agency and all, all the government agencies. I mean, those facts they put up, they're, just, they're the biggest laugh uh, in the show. Each time they come up, it's ah, great. Going to rip this one to shreds. <laughs> Because they are, you know, they're absurd, really. Um, they're, uh, the one that came up here, it meant nothing. I mean, it was like young people will experience disadvantage in the rural. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so in any other context, they might experience disadvantage. You know? well, but that's what the thing, what exactly? How you are, do you... you are battered over the head with the notion of young people in urban environments facing mm. disadvantage. But not, but, in... but not in the country. But particularly not in the Cotswolds. Well, I don't think, in a way, yeah, I think there's a lack of recognition of a, um, a rural working class, that's mm. for sure. Um, and there, there's an interesting relationship in the rural between the working class and the upper class. I don't know, you haven't really touched on, there isn't some sort of half-wit toff that we haven't done wanders toffs, into yeah. the scene, <laughs> but probably would have quite a close relationship with the characters, I mean, yes. in, in the way that, that, often, that often happens. Um, I was just thinking about, I mean, you know, Ruskin, of course, he was very aware about the rural working class and he had a great sort of drive to try and, you know, bring art to that. Well, he didn't want to bring art to them, but he thought that they were, they were the antidote to industrialisation. So it was more, in a way, it was more celebrating mm. the, the strengths of it, but, but of the, those cultures. But actually, he had to reinvent those cultures. They'd gone already. The Industrial Revolution had already eradicated, for example, um, spinning. So in the village of Coniston, where they set up a lace-making school, they had to work out how to make 
yarn. They had to work out how a spinning wheel worked. They had to remake those spinning wheels. And they had to do that with all of the craft cultures that they were trying to re-establish. Uh, they were invented. They weren't traditions. Uh, the traditions had, had gone. But what about, you know, his whole project for getting artists to come and, you know, produce paintings to the walls of institutes and setting up all those institutes right across, you know, northern England? I mean, that must have been some kind of cultural impetus. That was uh, an that. idea, really, a lot of those um, initiatives were to do with bringing people to God and civilising the working class. <laughs> So it was uh, nature was somehow a civilizing influence, and that, that notion of learning through nature was very central to Ruskin, very central to well, 20th century education, um, and embodied by all sorts of other people uh, late, later on. But uh, essentially, the um, mid 19th century uh, notion of the art gallery and, and a gallery for the people was about exposing people to landscape and through landscape they would get closer to, they would become religious, they would get closer to God. So something like the White Chapel was set up on exactly that basis, so, showing landscape painting to So is there this East sort of End. Puritan ascetic to the countryside that we have in this country? There's this idea that, there's sort of, that, that somehow, yeah, being in the landscape, there's a sort of Puritan idea about, yeah, being close to God and back to the reality of what really matters. Is it a kind of... Maybe we should open it up to, yes, the, to everybody that. else, to, to whether, how people understand... Mm. the rural because we've all expressed how, our opinion of it and there are obviously lots of other ways of looking at it and experiencing it and actually what this country does is uh, and I think a lot of what um, Grisdale does is, is it's arguably a dimension there's, there's, a, there's another dimension that it doesn't necessarily they don't necessarily engage with mm. Does anybody have any questions or observations they'd like to make? Does anybody like living here? <laughs> Is anyone actually from Bruton here? <laughs> And it's really in interesting what, what future for the countryside and what, what, again, what I was saying, what is it that you want to preserve? Because food production is probably going to move out of the country into urban um, warehouse type space, um, the bulk of food production. So in we're increasingly looking at uh, different roles for the countryside and maybe there's maybe hobby farming, uh, may be, so it may be involved in food production, but it's also going to be about recreation, it's going to be about retirement. There's a, there's a a host of different ways that the rural might be used. Lake District, where I come from, is uh, particularly, it's particularly obvious there because it is a leisure park. You know, and it is vastly used by um, the, the leisure industry and, and all the complexity of the leisure industry from motorcycles to walkers to hang gliders to scuba diving. To, there's no bit of the Lake District that somebody won't pop out of in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> as well yeah yeah so uh, there is a kind of re a, a process happening of how the rural is re-understood re and revisioned and what i want to hang on to is its its um randomness and and its mindset that that to me is the what is really valuable Mm. So, yeah, this is leisure industry that is quite frightening. It's particularly in your part and where I am in the Yorkshire Dales. I'm always very terrified of the leisure industry on any uh, level. I can't stand leisure. I never go on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, being as you're in the Lake District, what, um, I, the book by was of James Riggins, the Shepherd's oh, yeah. Life. And he had a very strong point about the, um, about the leisure industry and him being a sort of a, a farmer. Yeah. What I can't remember what his point was. I know him. <laughs> so, consequently, I've never read his books. So. <laughs> well, he 
he had been, he was uh, from the farm, from a sheep um, Yeah, I know, his, I know him about his background. And it wasn't for quite a long way in the book to realise that he, he ended up, though he left school at 16, he ended up going to Oxford. Um, and he's very much sort of chanting in the... Um, he went to Oxford and then he became an arts consultant. <laughs> <laughs> Before returning to being a shepherd. <laughs> but he did, he was very strong, strongly about, um, he had strong feelings about the sort of, um, the theme park in the theme park in the countryside. Yeah. I think sort of, it's one of those things you'd be talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, on a personal level, I find it irksome. But um, I, in terms of how the rural is used, um, I, and how that's managed, I think that is part of the future, and that, that it, need, it needs to be integrated in some way. It doesn't sit comfortably with farming. Farmers hate it, you know, basically. The, it's very dominant. There are certain leisure activities that, have, that dominate. Um, it, needs to, it needs to be balanced. It perhaps, perhaps it needs to be con there needs to be a slightly more control over how people enjoy leisure in the rural. Um, I think there's a real disconnect between the actual reality and, the, and actually uh, illustrated actually by people falling off mountains all the time. It's actually, it, it, isn't, a, it isn't a park and it, it, it doesn't have safety mats and it, it, it's a real place and if you go out on a really snowy day and climb uh, one of the higher hills you're putting yourself in danger and people, don't, they don't recognise it and that there's a very urban sensibility that is brought to the rural. And I, that's one of the things I also I see as perhaps if I l was looking at, at some what I s saw as a threat to the rural mindset, it would be the urban mindset. So the urban, the urban ruralist, I mean, people who live in, in central London are probably much more interested in the rural than people that live in the rural in many ways. They reflect it in their eating habits in their dress and all sorts of other ways. Increasingly, that vision of the rural, which is quite linear, which is the, you know, the bits that fit, is being transported back into the rural. So you have a kind of urban version of the rural um, played out in the rural. A little bit like reenactment. <laughs> a little bit like, like the arts and crafts movement. So in relation to that, how could you make this show somewhere else other than here? Would it be very different to maybe in London? And how, I mean, in a way that this packages up the countryside for yeah. the urban audience? Mm. I mean, I, was, I didn't think I said it earlier, but what I found quite interesting was the way that the press, on the whole, took it from an urban perspective and didn't quite get it. And then I really got a sense of the audience just walking around it going, yeah, this is our stuff. I know what this is all about. This makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I can see how these things collide and how they work. I recognize the material. Which I thought was kind of interesting. I think yeah, you can make you can make a show in an art gallery space anywhere, but I think um, Hauser and Worth adds a, adds it's the it's the sixth room of the show. So you know it does make a it's a really it, it adds to the complexity of the dialogue around what the future of the rural looks like. And I think that that was uh, it's, so it was a great place to do it. Yeah, you could apply that to a whole lot of things that <laughs> issues around, yeah, race and so uh, other, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, it's kind of a big subject to go into. Would you like to have a go at it? <laughs> We're definitely but obsessed yes. with class. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, but the rural, abuse. and it colours everything. But yeah. The, 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 you know, the the rivalry between town and uh, sorry, yeah, town and country. Probably, I don't. I don't think we're more than you know Germany or America or France, but yeah, class we seem particularly obsessed with. And in terms of you, um, I haven't seen this program at all, but it's on iPlayer. Okay. Both series available. <laughs> it's not on DVD. Kind of taps into for me a little bit. Is this sort of, um, and I don't know if this is particular to, to Britain as well. Is this kind of like working class voyeurism or kind of you know porn? Uh, 
are somehow different from us and that you know, they don't come and see art. So there's, you know, in a way it's, it's, it's true, it's, it's dealing with stereotypes, but then in some ways kind of feeding it back in. Has anyone said that to you before? Yeah, there's an element of reinventing the village idiot. Yeah, people who haven't watched the show say that. Yeah. That's generally the... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was going to say, it's as well. So, you know, how's your work? I'm sure we'll say, you know, this place is for everybody, but... I, I can tell you, I am, I'm, I'm not carrying curtain, but I'm just as out of my depth that how's and unworth this yeah. day would be. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and they don't, I mean, I, I live in the next council house and it's kind of peppered, you know, with different kinds of people, but carries and curtains definitely are, are there. I can give you lots of ideas for new characters if you want them. Yeah. Uh, next door neighbours and so on. But, um, <laughs> But they don't mix, you know. My next door neighbour would. I, I, I don't think that they're here anyway. I'm sure they're here. <laughs> here I am, but but they don't, you know. It's it is still a separate world, and I still think it's a bit of a kind of underbelly, you know. That's not really acknowledged as part of the rural, as say the exhibition here is mm. the way that it portrays portrays rural. But I love that show. I think it's sheer genius. Uh, because I can identify with it so readily, um, and it's because you were saying that, that you felt the same, and I, I thought, I thought in a place like Bruton, where there's so much privilege here, really, and increasingly, you know, more and more as as the years go on, it's 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 changing, um, and I like to feel that I can, I, I'll go in all directions, really, um, but the people that I live among, they stay there, and I can't imagine in the future that really changing. I think with all the changes in the countryside, with Brexit and all those different things that are going on, I can't see any kind of, any kind of help for, for those people, really. If art, if art were part of their lives when they were children, yeah. they might have a different response to it. But, and that's about it being valuable. So mm -hmm. the work, the way that we work, uh, Grisdale works on a very local level, on very much everyday, ordinary, how you live level in our local village and then we, we do our other things that are um, out, usually outside of the area tend not to do formal art within, within our village context and the point about it is to demonstrate to people that art is useful to them yeah, you know, everybody right. uses it all yeah. the time and that isn't the case, most people don't but as, yeah. it, it, as, you, as you, if you can demonstrate the value of it and the use of it then it starts to work. So things like the Honest Shop that's run here is something that we set up maybe, I don't know, five or six years ago in our village. And, it, and it, that does draw all sorts of different people in because they actually can use it and they can actually sell things and it actually encourages them to make things. And then if they make things and they make things better, they sell more of them and so on. So they're drawn, they're drawn in something that is, in a very simple way is useful and valuable to them, income generation. But it's also useful and valuable to them in a host of other ways in terms of opening up and um, a, a, as a form of education in itself. So I think that the, the strategies, the way that art needs to think about how it works has to be related. At, and I think it's really in, related to value and how it's valued. And I think that's really interesting to do that in a rural context and in many ways easier um, to work with, uh, well, the everyday. And not necessarily people in distress, which is the tendency for arts organisations based in, in urban places. You're working with how people use art, how, how it helps them and improves and develops their other thinking, other things that they do. They don't, I don't want people to end up making art. The last thing I want anyone to do. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> the, the thing yeah, is... Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. It is. In the first episode of the first series, Curtain is making his scarecrow. Yeah, the, 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 I noticed that, that is art. Yeah, but he would never describe it as art. But the care and attention that he lavishes on that scarecrow, and it's good. And he's very mocking of the other people that make, you know, in his opinion, half-assed scarecrows. It's just a rag on a stick. 
But he, has, the, he does have a very charm. artistic sensibility, doesn't he? I mean, he's got his crest, he's got his cooking, you know, he's a lot of he's things. Got his he does. Yeah. He's, yeah, I mean, he is very creative. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but I think there's also this thing where there's a sort of, it's like terror in the art world that somebody like Curtin and Carrie can just come in and totally prick the bubble, can't they? I mean, the slightly pretentious bubble that, you know, we live in as an art world. And that actually, as though it often feels quite out of the depth, maybe for people coming in, it's the same for the other way around. I mean, it's quite hard for artists to try and engage when they know that basically everyone's going to go, yeah, but what's that? You know, which is what artists get all the time, isn't it? So Kerry's clubhouse is a bit of contemporary art, surely. <laughs> <laughs> the, oh, the, 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 the dump door. gang. Yeah. yeah, the dump gang, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so do you think there is also, I mean, it's a two-way street, possibly. It's not very two-way, though, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. That's the slight drawback, yeah. theoretically. Yeah. It could be, or it should be, or maybe it will be. Are there any more questions before we wrap up? Oh, one over here. No, well, just a, a comment about the difference in countries. I, I'm American, but grew up um, with Indian heritage. In both countries, I think India and America have very different views on the relation between the urban and the rural than, than this conversation, really. I mean, in America, rural is, is um, threatening and, and, and something to be conquered, something to be explored. But, you know, I, I, it struck me when my, my wife and I were on honeymoon up in Scotland, and I saw this old man sort of totter off into the woods with a cane. And I was shocked. And I thought, in America, there would definitely be something dangerous in those woods. You wouldn't just go into the woods without thinking about it. And so that's kind of a very different thing. The Americans have this idea of a really rugged world. Mm. And the Indians just hate the world. And, and I think this is very different than in Japan. My mother came out, sorry, we live just down the road, my father's other. My mother came out, and she just started saying, why don't they just cut down all the hedgerows? Because you can't see the other cars. <laughs> and my wife was saying, well, there are animals that live in the hedgerows. My wife's obsessed with hedgehogs. And, and, and my mother just thought this was ridiculous. She said, there's no point because you can't see the other cars. I mean, in, in India, there's a real, almost a disdain for anybody who spends time in a rural environment. It seems a really lower class thing to do. So my mother absolutely cannot fathom why we would want to live. Well, I think that's true like uh, in this country as well. It's just, it, it's just sort of glazed over. There is, there is still a kind of rural underclass that is despised. I mean, I, as a rural curator, I, I never go to a big art thing without somebody making some really? bumpkin comment to me. <laughs> yeah. But, that, but, but, but you've described the kind of romanticization, romanticization of the rural from within the bounds of London, which I see with friends who live in New York. I mean, you go to Brooklyn, everybody looks like they live on the farm. They've yeah. never been to a farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they're definitely wearing country boots and plaid shirts yeah. and long beards. And so that, but that doesn't exist in India. You, you don't go no. to Bombay and see people who look like they could. Quite a lot, no. <laughs> Quite a lot of people wear, driving four-wheel drives with cut-off jeans jackets and dark glasses, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of rural language. Yeah. And quite a lot of film references the rural in, uh, in Indian film. But yeah, no, I can, I can recognize that. I mean, it's true of lots of places. I've just come back from Korea and that just the ambition for every parent is to educate their child to death in order that they won't have to live in the rural or do anything physical or practical. They will be able to work in an office. They will be able to join the, 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 the bureaucracy. And I think that's probably, you know, that's probably true in Japan to a degree. Uh, I think in a way it's probably true here too. I just congratulate you on that tea towel. I never thought I'd see a guided missile. Um, yeah, that's great. Salmon on the salmon. I didn't make it. It's real. It's really from the 1950s. <laughs> Sorry, um, from the you were about to say Yeah, something. I think um, it's only 20 years in Japan that uh, people start to think to live in rural. Uh, mm. Before that, I think uh, all the family were trying to educate, as you said, in Korea. It's, almost the same, because we had a tremendous economic growth until 80s, and until the beginning of the 20s and 90s. So people believe that we can live better and mm. be, become a big consumer. So go to Tokyo and go to you know, buy things that you want was more important thing. Mm. But I think, uh, it, mm, but we used to have a utopian idea of going to the rural, even in the uh, 50s and 60s. Mm. Um, the intellectual uh, community uh, based in the rural area, uh, that was quite popular thing in 60s and 70s. But didn't, it didn't really function well. Mm. Then um, 
I think uh, the relationship with the nature become more real after the 90s when the economy going down and we experience this earthquake or big natural disasters and becomes more important to go away from the urban cities. <laughs> You know, you, you, you cannot really produce anything in, in Tokyo. Mm. You know, so, so it's become more real now to uh, go outside of the, uh, the big cities, mm. I think. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think uh, Britain is the only country in the world where slightly more people move from the cities to the rural. And that's only in the last 10 years. But up to that point, the entire migration has been from rural to urban. And I've always wondered what it, what's, what's so attractive about urban. I'm, I've never been quite sure. Jobs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Evidence is that that isn't necessarily what happens when you go to urban places. Yeah. 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 It's an old story. Migrate to the suburbs. Yeah. <laughs> Suburban living, yeah. There's two. The halfway house. Orlando first, and then. working shortage. Yeah, well, yeah, jars <laughs> round. Jars <laughs> never outside. <laughs> uh, pots that don't pour, yeah. Subsidized, though, exactly. Yeah. I think there are immense opportunities. That, I, mean, I don't know if we've got time yeah. to carry on, but that, but there is briefly this idea of the, sort of the Omega workshop and these ideas of these workshops that set up, and they were. It wasn't about them being the perfect pots and the perfect. It was actually about making rather than the end result being... I mean, I think... Was, I can't remember, but I think he worked out quite quickly that it takes something like seven years to get good at something. So the plan with the Omega was just to start anyway and just see what happened. And as a result, the candlesticks were terrible. And I seem to remember Wyndham Lewis talking about how you stuck in it, sat in a chair and couldn't get up. You got stuck in them and things. Uh, arts and crafts are the same. <laughs> but it's this Very idea that actually the furniture. making was important, wasn't it? Rather than the actual yeah. perfect, you know, beautiful object at the end. And there is but I that. think um, this lady was saying that, mm. that, the, that it's a changing moment and there is enormous opportunity in the rural and it's a really dynamic and exciting place to work. And I think that's kind of the message that one wants to give out. This is, 
that the notion of the rural as, as uh, undynamic, which I think is what one wants to dispel, encourage young people to work here, all people to work here. Enjoy the collisions. Well, I think that's a very positive end note. Uh, thank you to Adam, Simon, and Fumihoko. Thank you very much.